early civilizations attributed mood, thought, and behavioral differences to spirits, gods, and demons. 18th century views were more humanistic and took into account the physical structure of the brain. Before psychiatry became a medical specialty, general physicians treated mental illness. The teachings of Dr. Benjamin Rush and of the phrenologists were short on therapeutics, but a turning point in identifying the mentally ill as a group with unique needs. In the beginning of the 19th century, a German physician, Johann Reil, coined the term psychiatry. Dr. Reil wrote about the suffering of the insane in asylums and developed treatment methods. He made the observation that suicidal patients who tried to drown themselves but survived often appeared to be temporarily cured. Thus, when patients seemed unresponsive, Dr. Ryle would dunk them under water or try to revive them by dripping hot wax on their hands or placing mice on their skin. Dr. Ryle believed that in addition to nervous system dysfunction, advances in civilization contributed to madness. Moral treatment was an approach to mental illness based on humane psychological and social care with pleasant and routine environments coupled with moral discipline. This treatment model had existed in ancient cultures, but faded. In 19th century Europe, moral treatment resurfaced in England under non-medical Quakers and in France and Italy under physicians Pinel and Chirurgi. The York Retreat in England used primitive affective conditioning to achieve cures. Debates existed over whether the cures were medical or spiritual. In either case, less harm came to patients. Meanwhile, in the United States, it became apparent that the asylum itself could be therapeutic. In America, Dr. Benjamin Rush at Pennsylvania Hospital developed humane approaches to treatment, employing sensitive and intelligent attendants to work closely with patients. The attendants regularly read and talked to patients and took them on walks. He also encouraged doctors to give small therapeutic gifts to their patients. Like other doctors of that era, however, Rush's treatments included bloodletting, purging, hot and cold baths, mercury, strapping patients to spinning boards, and tranquilizer chairs. These crude treatments and array of medications did little to improve the lives of persons with mental illness. Despite many such treatments, there was awareness that the brain was the seat of mental illness and that a medical approach to the brain could replace purely spiritual theories. Such was the case with phrenology, an import from Europe which captured the imaginations of Americans and their doctors. Phrenology had several premises. One, the brain is the seat of the mind. Two, mental faculties have specific anatomical locations, represented by 37 organs in the brain, controlling characteristics such as destructiveness, cautiousness, reverence, language, hope, time, self-esteem, and marvelousness. 3. The strength of each organ can be measured by its size. 4. The relative size of the organs is appreciable on the surface of the cranium. 5. It is possible to strengthen or weaken an organ through exercise or disuse. And 6. Injury to an organ will have corresponding clinical sequelae. Though a flawed science that gave way to fadism, phrenology, one could say, was the midwife to modern psychiatry. It was the first time mental illnesses were linked to derangements of brain and, just as important, to the possibility of change. Some of the early asylum superintendents, especially Amariah Brigham, were partial to phrenology. Indeed, Brigham, in the first volume of the American Journal of Insanity, 
praised the science. Brigham met phrenology's great promoter, Spurzheim, during his American tour and edited books by phrenologists. His influence flourished as editor of the journal, especially since he wrote many of the articles himself. Brigham, however, wrote to colleague Pliny Earle that he was not confident that the organs can be ascertained by external examination. In rural areas, families tended to their own members who had mental illness. As industrialization took hold, people moved to cities where the mentally ill roamed the streets. Society began to lock those with mental illness in jails with criminals, or to place them in almshouses with debtors. In 1834, the Boston Almshouse, originally intended to be a workhouse for the able-bodied poor, now contained 134 sick persons, 132 children, 104 school age and 28 at nurse, and a distressing 61 persons insane or idiotic. These early almshouses, or poor houses, were crawling with bugs and rats. Personal safety, food, and sanitation were far below common standards. The purpose of these places was separating the poor and mentally ill from ordinary people, and they received little or no therapy. Some grew into major hospitals, such as the New York City almshouse becoming Bellevue Hospital. Later, general medical and rarely psychiatric conditions were treated in major public hospitals, such as Bellevue, Philadelphia General, and Charity Hospital in New Orleans. While these hospitals flourished, conditions for the majority of the mentally ill worsened. Early in the 1800s, caring for people with mental illness was primarily custodial, meaning the focus was on housing, keeping them off the streets, and tending to their physical needs. In the 1840s, a New England school teacher, Dorothea Dix, shocked people as she drew attention to how terribly society treated citizens with mental illness. Miss Dix was a disciplined Puritan with strong beliefs about treating others with love, kindness, and human dignity. She lectured state legislatures and citizens in every state east of the Rockies, painting vivid pictures of the mentally ill in chains, sitting in their own filth, and having no access to kindness or medical treatments. I come to represent to you the condition of a numerous and unhappy class of sufferers who fill the cells and dungeons of the poor houses in the prisons of your state. I refer to the pauper and the indigent insane, epileptics and idiots of Pennsylvania. I come to urge their claims upon the Commonwealth for protection and support, such protection and support as is only to be found in a well-conducted lunatic asylum. I do not solicit you to be generous. This is an occasion rather for the dispensation of justice. These most unfortunate beings have claims, these claims which bitter misery an adversary creates, in which it is your solemn obligations as citizens and legislators to cancel. To this end, as the advocate of those who are disqualified by a terrible malady from pleading their own cause, I ask you to provide for the immediate establishment of a state hospital for the insane. Ms. Dix won many legislators to her dream of building state hospitals to provide humane treatment for the insane. Her first victory was in Trenton, New Jersey. At the end of her life, Miss Dix moved into an apartment at Trenton Psychiatric Hospital where she died in 1887. The large psychiatric hospitals became refuges for the poor, while private philanthropic asylums were built as sanctuaries for wealthy patients with mental illness. Such private asylums included the Charlestown Asylum, later to become McLean Hospital in Massachusetts. Sadly, many of the hospitals Miss Dix initiated failed to continue providing humane conditions and treatments. Instead, hospitals fell back into negligence and abuse. Legislators and the public seemed content with an out-of-sight, out-of-mind mentality. 
persons with mental illnesses were doomed to longer stays in institutions, most remaining isolated for the remaining days of their lives. Despite this, for thousands of unfortunate people without family support, psychiatric institutions provided housing, protection, and kindness for people with severe mental illness, allowing them to fare better than when they were left on the streets. In 1844, a pocket of optimism emerged when a group of asylum doctors developed the idea that they had more to offer than isolation. This small, exclusive club of 13 men was hosted by Pennsylvania Hospital's Thomas Story Kirkbride. They gathered at the Jones Hotel in Philadelphia to form the Association of Medical Superintendents of American Institutions for the Insane. During the next 80 years, the group expanded and in 1921 became the American Psychiatric Association. The American Psychiatric Association's logo bears the image of Dr. Benjamin Rush and the year 1844. Dr. Rush was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and is considered the first American psychiatrist. Discussion topics among the superintendents in 1844 resemble those in the 20th and 21st centuries. Moral, psychological, and medical treatments, restraints, suicide prevention, and the causes and prevention of insanity. Amariah Brigham, superintendent of the New York State Asylum in Utica, published the group's proceedings in the American Journal of Insanity. In 1921, this journal evolved to become the American Journal of Psychiatry. Early in the 19th century, people believed that insanity was a permanent condition. By mid-19th century, they began to believe that insanity could probably be cured, and later proclaimed that insanity was the most curable of medical illnesses. Asylum superintendents began to boast about their high cure rates. They misled the public and legislatures with inflated statistics, reporting the outcomes of patients who were discharged, while ignoring the rates of all patients who were admitted. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, and statistics. The public showed morbid interest in the investigations conducted about the disastrously recurrent insanity of England's King George III in 1789. By 1827, public attention focused on the opposite expectations, the curability of mental illness. An English physician, Dr. Burroughs, reported a 91% cure rate for insanity in his private asylum. He was soon outdone when an Englishman, Captain Hall, visited the Hartford Retreat and reported a 92% cure rate. These statistics were topped by one of the original APA founders, Dr. William All, of the Lunatic Asylum in Columbus, Ohio. He reported a full 100% cure rate, earning him the nickname Dr. Cure All. Although increasing numbers of patients remained on chronic wards of insanity hospitals, superintendents used their distorted cure reporting to procure monies from state legislatures. Institutions competed with one another for funding to expand. Some of the original 13 founders became caught up in the money-seeking frenzy of inflating cure rates. The pattern began to erode when Esquirol, the successor to Pinel at the Salpetriere in Paris, demonstrated how to use statistics accurately to measure cure rates. Immediately, American superintendents ridiculed his methods, ignoring that their measures had been vague, contradictory, and lacking precision. Eventually, one of the APA founders, Dr. Pliny Earle, promoted using careful statistical analyses by 1875, the deceptive exaggerations of cure rates abated, and despair returned to the old idea as Dr. Earle stated, 
Once insane, always insane. Nineteenth-century asylums were built in the countryside. There was a core building with wings housing 250 patients. Many of these magnificent structures, often called America's castles, were designed by Dr. Kirk Bride. Institutional life consisted of a superintendent making daily rounds on patients. Hospitals expanded in size by adding residential cottages around the main building so patients could live in smaller, more home-like structures. By increasing the numbers of patients, specialized services could be offered, such as music and art therapies, woodworking, and libraries. Patients could work by farming, cooking, or managing hospital shops and kiosks. They could also be placed in specialized cottages based on types of mental illnesses. Throughout the 19th century, many superintendents pushed for less use of mechanical restraints. Although European hospitals had done away with them, some American superintendents rationalized that Americans were so freedom-loving that they rebelled more than Europeans when they were hospitalized, making restraints necessary. Early in the asylum movement, there were complaints of medications being forced on patients. For example, Isaac Hunt wrote an expose of the treatment received from Dr. Isaac Ray at the Maine Insane Asylum in the 1840s, reporting he was forced to swallow wildfire pills, which caused him to have prolonged and severe chills and tremors. Unfair and often brutal treatment of women in asylums was reported by many historians. In 1860, Elizabeth Packard was committed to the Jacksonville Insane Asylum in Illinois by her husband, a strict Calvinist minister. Mrs. Packard had expressed religious beliefs that conflicted with Reverend Packard's. It was in Bible class that I defended some religious opinions which conflicted with the creed of the Presbyterian Church, which brought upon me the charge of insanity. It was at the invitation of the teacher of that Bible class that I brought forward my views to the consideration of the class. I had not the least suspicion of danger or harm arising in any way uttering some of my honestly cherished opinions. I regarded the principle of religious tolerance as the vital principle on which our government was based. I, in my ignorance, suppose this right was protected to all American citizens, even to the wives of clergymen. The result was I was legally kidnapped and imprisoned three years simply for uttering these opinions under these circumstances. Mrs. Packard addressed the Illinois legislature, arguing against the oppression of married women and for more regulated civil commitment. Her views were not shared by Dr. Isaac Ray, who considered physicians superior to judges in determining medical facts. In 1838, Dr. Ray published the first American textbook on forensic psychiatry. In A Treatise on the Medical Jurisprudence of Insanity, he compiled the clinical and legal traditions of Europe and set forth standards that have been followed ever since. In 1843, Daniel McNaughton, a Scot, believing he was shooting the English Prime Minister, fatally shot his secretary. Using Ray's book, McNaughton's lawyer was able to get an acquittal by reason of insanity. The resulting backlash from the verdict gave rise to the McNaughton rule, the right-wrong test, widely adopted in America and the prevalent standard of legal insanity in criminal matters. Over the 19th century, psychiatry evolved from a custodial to a biological approach. In 1865, Dr. Wilhelm Griesinger, professor of psychiatry at Berlin's Charité Hospital, established the first psychiatry department dedicated to research and teaching. He believed patients with mental illnesses should be reintegrated into society, proposing short-term hospitalizations combined with community support systems. 
Although there were physicians in large psychiatric institutions, psychiatry was not being taught in American medical schools for most of the 19th century. Among the first teachers were Drs. Pliny Earle at the Berkshire Medical Institute in 1864 in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and Isaac Ray at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia in 1871. Even so, psychiatry still lagged behind in research and integration into mainstream medicine. In the late 19th century, outpatient psychiatric nerve clinics developed in Philadelphia and Boston. Neurologists, not psychiatrists, led research. They focused on physiological causes of mental illness, rather than on ways environment, thinking, and emotions interact with the brain. Responsibility for psychiatry resided with the superintendents of mostly rural asylums. They were aloof from the medical community, far from centers of academic medicine. Caught up in administration and understaffed, their research output was nil. Pressure to change came from neurologists, who functioned outside hospitals in private offices or in academic centers and who were critical of psychiatrists. Dr. Silas Weir Mitchell was well known for helping Civil War soldiers and developing the rest cure for treating neurasthenia in women. Treatment consisted of isolation, confinement to bed, overfeeding, electrical stimulation, and massage. Dr. Mitchell took psychiatry to task in 1894 as an invited but reluctant speaker at the 50th annual meeting of the superintendents in Philadelphia. You were the first of the specialists and you have never come back into line. It is easy to see how this came about. You soon began to live apart and you still do. Your hospitals are not our hospitals. Your ways are not our ways. You live out of range of critical shot and not preceded and followed in your ward work by clever rivals or watched by able residents fresh with learning of the schools. Organized psychiatry, to be led by Dr. Adolf Meyer, was ready to answer Mitchell's challenge, but not ready to dismantle the asylum model. In the 1880s, Dr. Mitchell was the physician for Charlotte Perkins Gilman, author of The Yellow Wallpaper. Ms. Gilman wrote a fictionalized story based on her experiences with the rest cure. It was the story of a woman being driven insane by the treatment, confined to her upstairs bedroom by her physician husband, and forbidden from working so she might recuperate from a slight hysterical tendency. In order to control his wife's movements about the house, the woman's husband barred the bedroom windows and blocked the steps with a gate. The woman descended into madness as she obsessed about her bedroom wallpaper. It is the strangest yellow, that wallpaper. It makes me think of all the yellow things I ever saw. Not beautiful ones like buttercups, but old, foul, bad yellow things. But there is something else about that paper. The smell! The only thing I can think of that it is like is the color of the paper. A yellow smell. Women who had undergone the rest cure included the French sculptor Camille Claudel and famous American women Zelda Fitzgerald and Virginia Woolf. In the 20th century, the rest cure was deemed to be inappropriate and harmful. In addition to neurology, psychology also informed the young specialty of psychiatry. Dr. William James was an American physician who grew up in an influential family that included his brother and sister, novelist Henry James and diarist Alice James. He wrote about educational psychology, religious experience and mysticism, and on the philosophy of pragmatism. Dr. James enrolled in Harvard Medical School in 1865, but one year later contracted a prolonged illness during a biological expedition in Brazil. Between treatments in the famous baths of Germany, he studied psychology under Hermann von Helmholtz. 
before returning to complete Harvard Medical School. Dr. James continued to suffer from neurasthenia and severe depression, which he described as soul sickness. I take it that no man is educated who has never dallied with the thought of suicide. James wrote that humans had many instincts, even more than other animals. He theorized that instincts could be overridden by experience. In 1875, Dr. James gave the first American course in experimental psychology at Harvard University. In an article entitled, What is an Emotion? He outlined a sequence of events that begin with arousing stimuli affecting either the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous systems, leading to impassioned feelings then perceived as conscious emotions. As he saw it, bodily sensations are what told humans how they were feeling. Dr. Sigmund Freud started as a neurologist in Austria, studied and wrote about brain disease, and founded psychoanalysis. Although Freud's theories had their strongest impact in the first half of the 20th century, he began in the late 19th century to develop theories of the unconscious mind, the mechanism of repression, and principles of psychoanalysis. Freud theorized that sexual drives were the primary motivational forces of human life. He developed therapeutic techniques, such as using free associations, studying transference, the emotions patients develop toward therapists during therapy, and how such transferences reveal important therapeutic information. Freud studied patients' dreams to gain insights into unconscious desires. In 1885, Freud studied in Paris with Dr. Jean-Martin Charcot, a renowned neurologist and researcher of hypnosis. Charcot displayed patients in front of audiences to demonstrate hysteria and susceptibility to hypnosis. Initially, Freud was so impressed that he turned from his studies of neurology to medical psychopathology. Eventually, he abandoned hypnosis as a cure for mental illness, developing his own therapeutic theories about free association and dream analysis. Freud developed treatments in which patients spoke about their problems, named The Talking Cure by Anna O., oh, a patient treated by Freud's colleague, Josef Breuer. Freud's goal was to locate and release powerful emotional energies that had initially been rejected or imprisoned in his patients' unconscious minds. Freud called this psychic action repression, and he believed that it was an impediment to the healthy functioning of the psyche, causing symptoms to surface which he termed psychosomatic. In 1899, Freud published The Interpretation of Dreams. He considered this to be his greatest contribution, and it launched international interest in his theories. A circle of faithful supporters developed, carrying his work into the 20th century, when almost all chairs of American departments of psychiatry were credentialed as psychoanalysts. During the 19th century, the trend of housing people with mental illnesses in almshouses and prisons decreased. Many general hospitals developed psychiatric wards. Giant state psychiatric hospitals were built in the countryside to reduce the effects of industrialization, a possible cause of mental illnesses. Patients worked at state hospitals, gardening, and tending to dairy cattle. Some patients even worked in coal mines. This allowed the institutions to become almost self-contained as if they were small cities. Hospital staff members even lived on the hospital grounds. Pilgrim State Hospital in Brentwood, New York, boasted that it was the largest state psychiatric hospital with 16,000 patients. From 1775 to 1900, approaches to mental illness evolved from placing patients in jails and almshouses 
to treatment in asylums, to warehousing patients in large state hospitals beyond the ideal size Dr. Kirkbride envisioned. Interventions progressed from none to moral treatment, while psychiatric theories ranged from phrenology to the psychology of emotions to dream interpretation and psychoanalysis. Psychiatry appeared in the curricula of a handful of medical schools. Within a few years, it would stand beside other specialties and enjoy a permanent place in medical education.